like a side. First, I'm passing around old homework assignments. There's nothing new in here, but you might have something in here if you didn't pick it up previously. Go ahead and take it home. I also have midterms up here that are graded. If you didn't pick yours up in class, you're welcome to see me after recitation, and we can hand those out to the parents. You have a problem set due this Friday. It's problem set four. It's the one that went out halfway through break there, so please do submit it as per the instructions. I think your options are to submit it online or to get it to me earlier than that. Um, yeah, which would probably mean recitation or email me to set up something else. I don't know if you just going to have his office hours on Friday. But do email me if you're not going to turn it online and make sure you set up the time to get me a physical copy or just turn it in, in class on Thursday. It would probably be your next best bet, which would be tomorrow if you have it done. We will take questions on that for a few minutes here when I'm done. Looking ahead at that problem set, you, you have two problem sets and two programming assignments all due between now and the end of the semester. That first problem set, like I said, is due this Friday. After that, you have your last two programming assignments back to back at a week and a half each. And then that last week of school, you have one more problem set due and then the final. So it gets busy, walking to the end of the semester, not a lot we can do about it. but. Do make sure you're keeping up with this stuff, because now would not be a good time to fall behind. So, most of what we're going to be talking about today is your next programming assignment, programming assignment four. We will go over that for, like I said, the bulk of the lecture. That will be released Friday night, due a week and a half after that, so the following, a week from the following Wednesday. So your next programming assignment is essentially due two weeks from yesterday. That Wednesday we released the last programming assignment. You also have a week and a half on it, so it's due essentially three weeks from Friday, and then that last Friday is your final problem set due. So you have one week to do that and have the last programming assignment. So, lots of excitement, but they are with us and we'll get there. So before we get into the next programming assignment, are there any questions on the current problem set, problem set four, that's due this Friday? Once. Okay, I will just talk to you about the next programming assignment. So all of you should be already have or in the midst of grading for programming assignment three right now. That's going to get extended through next week so that Juno can finish up his sessions. <coughs> Please make sure that you have scheduled a session. If you haven't, do so immediately. Don't yeah, miss a programming. Don't, don't miss a grading session. It doesn't go well for you. Um, but your next programming assignment, like I said, is released this Friday. And what it deals with is paging, essentially. It's an assignment where your job is to implement a paging strategy. So if you think back to those of you that took 2400 or those of you that didn't, hopefully you have some relevant experience in this area. But in 2400, we wrote a dynamic memory. We essentially wrote a implementation of what malloc does. What you're going to be doing in this is you're kind of writing the lower level memory management strategies within the operating system, namely the paging system. Um, you're doing it in the simulator, not actually in Linux, because the Linux modifying the Linux pager directly is, has a bit of a learning curve. So we won't subject you to that, given that you only have a week and a half. But what you're doing is akin to the same kind of thing you would be doing if your job was to write the page fault handler essentially inside a kernel, only without the overhead behind the field track of the kernel. So you've been talking about virtual memory and the like in class. We'll just do the 30 second, which will inevitably turn into a 10 minute rundown here, um, of how virtual memory works, what paging is, and thus what your job as the person implementing the paging strategy really is. So if we think about the paradigm that most modern operating systems have adopted in terms of memory management is each process has effectively a global view of the address space. As far as each process is concerned, it can see all memory and it can access all memory from address 0 to the highest, I mean on a 64-bit system, to 2 to the 64th, the largest possible memory address, address of all ones. Now, this is an illusion that we give to processes. Processes do not actually have the ability to access all memory space. That would be problematic for a number of reasons. One, multiple processes would interfere with each other if they tried to access the same part of memory. And two, 
very rarely do you actually, or for unless you have access to some kind of sleep technology that I can't get, uh, you definitely don't have a computer that has two to the 64th bytes of RAM available inside of it. Um, do the math, that's a lot of RAM. So to, to solve this problem on two fronts, both to make sure processes can interfere with each other and to allow processes to have this illusion without having to actually have as much physical RAM as we are giving them access to memory space for, we use what are called virtual memory systems. Where we go ahead and say, this is an illusion, this is a virtual memory address space. It does not necessarily correspond to the physical memory address space. Instead, we then have the physical memory address space on our system, where this is more reasonable and it goes from zero to four gigabytes or however much RAM you happen to be dealing with. Um, and this is what you actually have access to. Now, this does beg the question, well, how do we translate these addresses to this? And we went over a lot of this in 2400 and spent time on it, so we're not gonna dive into all of the details of how addresses get subdivided to make this translation easier. You can reference it in your OS book or you can pull out the Turnfinder book if you need to look at that. But the effective gist of it is, within this address space, we're gonna divide it up into blocks of addresses that we call pages. So these will be called pages. Each page will be a specific size. I mean, if you pick, we'll say we have one kilobyte pages. So this first page goes from 0 to 1024, the next page, or 0 to 1023, the next page goes from 1024 to 2047, and so on and so forth. Um, where each of these pages controls essentially, these pages are the blocks that we handle mapping in. So it would be a pain to handle mapping for every single address. So instead, we only handle mapping for the blocks, so we have to keep track of essentially less state and less mappings in total. Our physical memory then, we also divide up into pages, where in physical memory we often call pages frames, but it effectively means the same thing. So we divide our physical memory up into these blocks of addresses, as well where these, the, the frame size here matches the page size here. So this would also be one for the And then we create a mapping between them. So we say for this process, this page might actually be mapped up here. This page might actually be mapped down here. This page might actually be mapped up here. Where sitting in between us, we have your processor's MMU, or memory management unit. Where essentially the memory management unit maintains a set of state tables that essentially handles this mapping for us. So that when this process goes to access address 3073, or 3, yeah, then the MMU knows how to translate that to the corresponding page and offset in actual memory so that it's completely transparent to the process that this is going on underneath. People are kind of comfortable with this gist. So if we live in a world where the number of physical pages, so if this process, say, never actually uses the bottom half of this space, <laughs> if it only ever tries to access these five pages, then we're in good shape. We can map all of these pages into physical memory directly, and everything's always what we call swapped in. Anytime we go to access one of these pages, it has a corresponding physical location currently stored in main memory. Now, as you might imagine, in reality, this is not how things always work. In particular, you get into the issue where, I mean, one way or another, either because you have a single process that needs more memory or because you're running 100 processes at once, you get into the situation where you can't actually map everything directly into physical memory. So if we call this process. We have another process here. It now goes from 0 to the 62, so on and so forth. And we want to map in its pages. And I'm going to make my memory space smaller to make my life easier. So, we got one spare one up here. But we have one page that it might want to access that we can't actually fit in physical memory. So what do we do? Well, some systems don't do anything. They just say, I'm sorry, we're out of memory, and crash this program effectively. Now, if you're using a Mac circa 1999, <coughs> this is a problem you probably would run into. Uh, but on modern systems, the way we tend to handle this is we say, well, 
we might have a limited space of RAM, but we have tons of secondary storage. We have a lot of extra space on our hard disk or on some kind of a secondary storage medium. So what we can do is we can actually store some of these pages on the hard disk or in some kind of a secondary location that isn't main memory, where we normally refer to the parts of secondary location that we use for this as swap space, either in the form of a swap file or in the form of a swap condition. Now this is great because it effectively means that we can have processes that use or, or that at least have references to more memory than is available in any given time. The downside is, well, now we have to control the mapping of what's stored on secondary storage and what's stored on primary storage. Secondary storage is very slow. So we don't want to be accessing stuff that's stored on secondary storage directly, really. And, and the simple fact of the matter is you can't access it directly. This memory management unit, which is what actually handles this translation, isn't really aware of what's going on in this swap space here. So when the memory management unit gets an access to something that it doesn't have a mapping for, it can't do anything about it. Even if it could somehow shuttle that over here to the hard disk and have you write directly to the hard disk, it would be really slow, you would want to do it, but sometimes matters you can't even do it in the first place. So any address that is currently being accessed, you have to make sure is stored actually in physical memory. So you never actually, you can use this as essentially a secondary data store, but your pages in here are kind of just hanging out and waiting. They're not currently in use. As soon as a page needs to be used, you have to somehow move it into the main memory hierarchy and out of the secondary memory hierarchy. People okay? Mm -hmm. So the question then becomes, how do we do this? And this is the concept of having things swapped in and swapped out. So pages that are currently occupied frames in the primary memory hierarchy are referred to as pages being uh, referred to as swapped in. So these are pages that are currently available. They're pages we can reach and write to right away. They're pages that the memory management unit has an active translation for somewhere in the page table, somewhere in the TLB. There's a lot of extra magic that happens in here, but there exists a valid mapping somewhere within that hardware and that hardware's data structures. Pages that are not stored in main memory, but that still have valid references somewhere are what we call swapped out. And those are the ones that live in secondary storage. And what happens is, if this process goes to access memory down here on this page, it essentially sends that memory access request to the MMU. The MMU goes, you're requesting memory that I have no valid mapping for. Now, this tends to happen in one of two situations. Either your program's made an access to a memory location that doesn't exist, which would mean that eventually you're going to seg fault, or what happens far more frequently, you've made, a memory, you've made a valid memory access, it's just to a page that isn't currently swapped in, so the MMU doesn't know about it. So what does the MMU do in this situation? Well, the MMU says, I can't handle this, it's the operating system's problem. So it throws what's called the page fault signal, which says to the operating system, look, this page is being requested, I don't have access to it, it's your problem. Then it's the operating system's job to check, well, the operating system can go, there is, in fact, a valid mapping. It's just not one the MMU is aware of because it's in secondary storage. If we requested something off here that isn't actually a valid mapping, then the operating system would trigger a segmentation fault and you'd get a seg fault and all of that good stuff. Um, instead, you're just going to, if it's a valid mapping in this case, you're just going to get what's called a page fault. When you get a page fault, the operating system's job is to go, well, look, I have a page stored somewhere in secondary memory. I have to move it to primary memory, and then I have to repeat whatever access was trying to get it in the first place. So how this is done, if you had a spare slot, it would be easy. You just put it in there. The issue is in a situation like this where no spare slots, the hard part isn't deciding which page to swap, swap in. We know which page we need to swap in is when it is not requested. The hard part is deciding which of these pages to swap out, where our goal is ideally we want to swap out a page that isn't going to be needed anytime soon, because this is a very expensive process. And if we spend ourselves having to do it a lot because we're always swapping out non-ideal pages, we're just going to really bog down the system. So through some magic, the operating system has to go into here. It has to erase one of these mappings, copy that information to secondary storage, and update its mapping. It then copies the information that was in secondary storage into primary storage and informs the MMU of the updated mapping into physical storage. It then repeats whatever instruction was caused in the memory access that happens again. This time when it hits the MMU, the MMU has a valid mapping. It looks up the appropriate data, returns it. And as far as the program is concerned, nothing happened behind the scenes other than the fact that this was a particularly slow memory access. 
So people are kind of comfortable with the idea of what's going on here. So like I said, the real crux is how the page handler decides which page to swap out. And writing an implementation that does that effectively is essentially your goal on this next assignment. So like I said, on this next assignment, we're not going to have you guys working directly in the Linux kernel just to avoid the overhead of having to deal with the Linux kernel. Instead, you guys are going to be working in a simulator where effectively what the simulator does is it plays the part of operating system and memory management unit and architecture and then just hands all of the paging requests off to you to handle in some function you implement. So we'll look at some code here in a sec. But to look a little bit at kind of the environment that the simulator sets up to be in. The simulator sets out to set up an environment where you have some number of processes running. Where you can modify these constants. The default constant, the one we use for testing is, your simulator runs 20 processes, essentially. So you're working on an operating system where there are 20 processes running. So I'm just going to draw three of them. Each process has a virtual memory space of up to 20 pages. So I'm not going to fit this all here. But if you forgive me not actually drawing 19 crossbars, uh, you have from page 0 effectively to page 19 where these 20 pages represent the virtual address space for any given process. You have a page size, by default it's 128, so this page 0 to 19 translates to memory addresses 0 through 20 times 128 minus 1, right? Um, so this is your minimum memory address in your virtual address space, this is your maximum virtual address in your memory space. Each of your 20 processes has access to this entire address space and can use it pretty much however it sees fit. Now, when we write programs, or when your program runs, there's essentially two situations, or, or two core situations, where it needs to access things in memory. What are they? Read and write what? Data. So there's data. If you need to read or write something like a large array, you have, need to manipulate data directly in memory, something that's not stored in one of your registers, then yes. You may need to read or write data in memory. So that's one of them, needing to manipulate data. What's the second one, and actually the one that's far more common? Reading instructions. It's reading instructions themselves. So you know, 40 years ago, when we decided that computing was going to be the way it was going to be for the next 50 some odd years, we made the decision that we were going to work with computing architectures that treat memory, that, that treat instructions and treat data as essentially uniform. We don't have separate memory hierarchies for them, we only have one. We store our data in the same RAM that we store our instructions, so on and so forth. So while data is important, and it comes into this paging strategy too, what actually tends to drive your paging strategy is instruction execution. Because you're way more likely to need to access a page because your program counters advance to that page and you load that instruction than you are if you just happen to be dealing with a program that has a giant array or something that you have to manipulate memory. So for the sake of the simulator, we ignore data altogether. All we're dealing with is memory accesses from code execution. So effectively, you can think of this address space that each of these processes has access to. This is the address space where the code for that process could be stored. So in addition, each of these processes has maintained a program counterfeit that points to some location. That has a program counter that points to some address somewhere in this address space, where that address is dictated <laughs> that program counter currently needs in order to make any progress on the program. So this is what the backing looks like. You have these processes. They have access to this address space. Each process then also has with it, which you're, you kind of help maintain, but each process has essentially a map of which pages are in use, where this is just a binary map where a 1 indicates that the page is currently swapped in, a 0 indicates that the page is swapped out. Right? So this is kind of equivalent to how your MMU maintains, a, I mean, like a valid bit in your MMU's page table or something along those lines. Okay? 
On your regular system, it's maintained per system. In the simulator, it's maintained per process. So each process has one of these maps. So on and so forth. So this is the information we have about each process. We know that it's memory space. We, we know the extent of the possible memory space. We know where the program pattern is currently located, which dictates the page that currently must be swapped in for it to continue running. And we know which pages are swapped in and swapped out. We also, in this system, have a physical page store that consists of 100 pages. So 20 processes, up to 20 pages each, but only 100 physical pages. So you could conceivably need to access 20 by 20 or 400 virtual pages, essentially what you have available. Those 400 virtual pages at any given time, at most 100 of them can be swapped in. The other 300 have to be swapped out in fictional secondary memory. It's not really your job to worry about that. All you know is if it's not in here, it's somewhere in here. Okay? So what happens is, for any of these pages that are ones, that means that they must be swapped in somewhere in here. And the zeros thus then aren't swapped in. So this simulator runs all 20 of these processes. The processes advance, and pretty much every time step in the system, which the system calls a tick, the, the system calls, or anytime something interesting happens in terms of memory, the system calls your page handler, where your page handler gets past an array of structs that give you all of the data about each of these processes. One element in the array corresponds to each process. So you're given the memory map for each process. You're given the program map for each process. Um, from that information, you can deduce which page each process needs. Now, your goal is to run all of these processes as quickly as possible. And obviously, if a process's program counter is sitting on a page that isn't currently swapped in, then this program can't be running. It's blocking right now. It just has to hang out until that page gets swapped in, and it can read the next instruction and actually continue the program. So your goal is to swap in the appropriate pages such that you can make this happen in the maximum amount of time. Now, every iteration or, or every step in the program, every execution of a single instruction takes like what the simulator refers to as a single tick. So if I have a for loop that executes 10 times and the for loop has five instructions inside of it, then this takes me 50 ticks to run that for loop. One tick per instruction and then I'll repeat it 10 times. To swap a page in or out takes 100 ticks. That's just an overhead, the overhead that the simulator imposes on you to do a paging operation. So if you're in the worst possible situation where every time you advance to the next spot in your program counter, you somehow wind up on a page that is swapped out, then for every one tick of useful work you have to do, you're going to end up having to do 200 ticks of paging work. 100 ticks to make room for a page, and then 100 ticks to actually swap in the page you need. So the metric that kind of evaluates your performance in this whole thing is a ratio of the ticks spent doing paging versus the ticks spent doing useful work. So this can also be thought of as the amount of time your processes have to spend blocking versus the ticks spent doing useful work. Where when you get done running all of this, the simulator spits out some metric here, and the smaller this metric, the better you've done. We're going to look at a solution here in a second that has a metric of about 15. 15 is still really bad. That means we're spending 15 as much time dealing with page, 15 times as much time dealing with paging as we're actually spending doing useful work. So good scores are always less than one and are generally less than 0.1 or even 0.01, really good scores get down into like the 0.001 territory. So your grade on this assignment, like your grade on other assignments, is 40% due to your program and 60% due to your ability to defend in a grading session. That 40% is going to basically just be a linear score of how well you do is going to dictate where you fall on that 40% grade, where, I don't know, a B is probably somewhere in this range. This is really not a B, but this would be like, 35 out of 40 or something. We'll, we'll formalize all of this. But essentially, how well your program performs is going to dictate your score on the 40% portion of the assignment. People with me thus far? Yeah. 
So your job is to write this function called pageit, which gets called every time something interesting occurs, and gets passed basically the state information about all the processes that are currently executing. You have the ability to call two functions, page in and page out, where each of those functions, you pass them which process you want the page to be swapped in or out for, and then the page number of that process that you need to swap in or out. So effectively, your job, I mean, it's, it's a pretty simple API. You implement one function, and you call two other functions. And how you choose to do that comes down to the cleverness of what you actually want to implement, where you want to pick a strategy that does much better than 15. The way this 15 works, and the way the implementation we're going to look at in a sec, I mean, there's a number of ways to do this. Um, like we mentioned earlier, least recently used tends to be one of the common strategies for doing something like this. Least recently used will get you in with this range. Uh, it doesn't get you much better than that. Where the goal of least recently used is you keep track of the last time every page in your system was essentially touched, the last time it was utilized. And when you have to swap out a page, you search that list and you find the page that was accessed least frequently. So the page that hasn't been used in the longest amount of time and you swap that one out. The theory being that if you haven't touched it in a while, it's probably because whatever was using it has gone off to do something else, and it's thus a good candidate to swap out. Now, it's better than nothing, uh, but that doesn't really push you as, I mean, there, there's some problems with this assumption. Often, the page that hasn't been touched in the longest time, especially in big loops, is the one that's gonna need to be used most frequently next, because if you're doing a big loop, you haven't gotten back to it for a while, that means you're getting close to the end of the loop where you're gonna loop back and need that page again. So. The strategy can totally backfire, and that's why for certain program types, you just can't do any better. To really get good scores, you have to get into what are called the set of predictive strategies, where essentially your program needs to analyze the program counter movement for every current process, and based upon its previous movement, you try to make predictions about where it's going to go next, such that you can guarantee that wherever it's going next, those pages are swapped in before it actually gets there. Does that kind of make sense? So you're given a little bit of information to help you do this. You're actually told that each of these 20 processes is running one of five different programs, and you're given those five programs. So you can do some heuristic analysis to try to determine which program is currently being run by each process. And if you can figure out which program is being run, then you can know exactly where the program counter is going and essentially make predictions about it. Now, in real life, MMUs can't do that, but they can still do various forms of generalized prediction, where you may not know exactly what programs are going on, but you can look for patterns in the program, things like loops that are occurring. And once that loop's run twice, it's probably gonna run 100 times. You can then ensure that any parts of that loop are currently loaded in the memory, and you can do some other stuff like this. So to really get a good score on this assignment, you have to get into predictive algorithms. Your first just one-off solution is probably at least recently used, because that's pretty easy to implement. But uh, to really drive this score down into the interesting territory, uh, you can get into some pretty interesting predictive analyses. Um, I need you guys double E's when you are, right? If you have a good background in control theory, you can do a lot of cool state-space stuff on this kind of ground. But I mean, that's getting into super advanced territory. So, uh, LRU is going to give you a score right where? I, so I haven't run my LRU solution since I did this two years ago, but I, I think LRU is somewhere in this range. Yeah. It's not all that great. Uh, partially because of the way a lot, a lot of these have like big loops and stuff in them that break LRU. And there's different ways to do LRU. You could do a global LRU that searches all of them, or you could do this, you could, you could pre-of 20 processes, you can say every process gets five pages, and then you can do an LRU amongst those five pages for each process. So there are ways to make LR, I mean, you can do a more or less optimal LRU, which kind of affects where it falls in there, but even the best LRUs are never going to drive you way down here. You kind of have to get into predictive strategies to really dive down into this. Other generalized questions before we actually look at Okay, so these details are all in the write-up that we'll give out Friday too, um, but this is kind of the overview of what you're dealing with. Your job is to control this mapping in what would be the most intelligent manner possible. So I've written a really trivial solution to this program, where what my solution does, actually maybe it's uh, what my solution does is it says, well, 
Every individual process only needs at most 20 pages. I have 100 pages. So if I only run one process at a time and let that process run to completion, when a process completes, the system frees all of its pages. So if I only ever run one process at a time, I'm never going to need more than 20 pages. I'm never going to have to swap anything out in the first place. And I can kind of write a very trivial solution that doesn't deadlock, completes successfully, and has kind of terrible performance. So that's the solution I'm looking at now. Its goal is essentially, I just activate all the pages for process one. I let process one complete. These all then go back to zero because it releases its pages when it exits. I then act activate all the pages for process two, let process two complete, so on and so forth. Where I don't actually preemptively activate all of these, that would actually do a little bit better. I activate them as they're requested, but I only want one process at a time. So I have some code in here that handles the swap out, but it never actually gets run. Um, because all I'm dealing with is the one process at a time. Your battery's much better. Okay. Yeah, well, so that's relative on that book. About stop means yeah. I have an hour and 43 minutes. Wow. <laughs> that's a um, But thank you. So let's first look at you. You're going to have a number of files here. The simulator.c file is the core code of the simulator. You don't need to modify that. You have access to it, you're welcome to look at it if you think it'll help you, uh, but don't spend time modifying it to try to do it better because when you run your code for the grading session, I'm just gonna run it for the vanilla version of the simulator anyway. So don't waste your time trying to make the simulator better. It does what it does and your job is just to work within those constraints. The simulator.h file, which is what we'll look at now, kind of gives you, uh, this is where the data structures, constants, and functions that you deal with, this is your interface into the simulator. As you can see, like we talked about, this is where some of those high-level constants are defined. Each page has a virtual memory space of 20, or each process has a virtual memory space of 20 pages. The maximum of processes is also 20 processes. That's running around once. Page size is 128. It takes 100 ticks to swap in or out a page. And the number of physical pages is 100. Um, you're then given this key entry. This is essentially the data about each process, the state data about each process that you have access to when you're doing your paging. You have just this active flag that's just a zero or one. It's a one if the process hasn't completed. It's a zero if the process has completed. This is the program counter of the process. Uh, this is the number of pages the process has in use. We don't really need that. I actually need to verify something about that. Um, but the most important things here are the program counter, which tells you where it is, the active, and then, which tells you whether or not it's running, and this array of pages down here, which is essentially your bitmap of which pages are swapped in and which pages are swapped out. So you never manipulate anything in this array directly, but you get handed this array, and that's how you can find out about each process. The simulator is whose job it is to update this array. You shouldn't be changing anything in here. You should just be reading data from it. We then have the three functions that we need to deal with. Like we said, we have the page in and page out functions. These functions, um, you pass them the process and the page that you want to deal with. Like we said, our page maps are per process, so each of these goes from 0 to 19 for pages, and then from 0 to 19 for the process, with 20 processes, 20 pages per process. They return ints, where if you try to page out a page that isn't currently swapped in, so something you can't page out, this returns a 0. Otherwise, if it can start a paging out process, or if that page is already in the process of being paged out, then this returns a 1. Page in works the same way. If you try to page in a process, but all of the global pro all of the global pages are already in use, uh, this is going to return a zero. If this can successfully start a paging in process, it returns a one. Or if that page is already in the process of being paged, it returns a one. You guys have to remember that since each of these operations takes 100 ticks, and more or less this is getting called every tick, you're going to wind up in repetitive situations where you're going to get asked for if, if, if you get a program counter that's pointing at a specific page and that page is swapped out. It's not like as soon as you start paging in that it's going to stop asking you for it. It's going to keep asking you for it for the next 100 ticks until it actually gets paged in, which is going to allow it to continue. So you can write some optimizations to kind of make that a little bit more intelligent. But um, you may very well wind up in situations. It's not like you just call this once and never call it again. You may wind up in situations where you call a paging in process on a page you previously called, which is why this returns one if you're started one there. So, so return of one just means that paging process is in progress. How much time it has left, you can't really say. If you can start it, it has 100 ticks left. If it's been going, you may only have one tick left. Um, there's really no callback. The only update you get that one of these has completed successfully 
is the corresponding page map will be updated in the process of the request. So we're, we're not doing anything with a page call signal handling then. So we're, we're not getting loops to lock on a page ball and then No, the simulator effectively does that. Okay. Um, so we are going to get called a hundred times. So we'll let, we'll yeah, I mean, you get called pretty much every day, yeah. uh, um, uh, which you need to do some good predictive stuff uh, because that allows you to track. But um, yeah, you pretty much get called every day. If every process is currently running on a page, I, I don't, if every process is currently running on a to double check on the simulator, if every process is currently using a page that's swapped in, I don't know if you get called. But the probability is, with 20 processes, one of them is probably page faulting somewhere. So you get called a lot. Um, but just because a new process page faulted, there may be a previous process you've already dealt with. It's just not done. It could still be in the faulting state. It doesn't like erase that state from you. So just to clarify, the, the signal handlers, the page fault signal handler is part of the simulator, and that's calling us? Yes. Oh, okay. So your job is to write the page function. Right. This is effectively the page fault signal handler, where it, it gets called in a few situations. It also gets called when something exits. This basically gets called anytime something interesting happens with respect to memory. So it gets called more frequently than a pure page fault handler would get called, because you're also maintaining, keeping track of some of the things that are normally be kept track of in the MMU. Okay. Um, but effectively, your job is to write this function. It passes to you this array of state information about every running process. And then your job is, from inside this function, make intelligent calls to page in and page out, such that this state information eventually winds up in a, uh, in a configuration that allows these processes to complete effectively. All right. So if we actually look at my basic simulation, or my basic implementation, so this is brain dead implementation that I just talked to you about, like, so it basically runs one thing at a time. I'm implementing, I mean, there's no main in any of this. You have to realize you're writing part of a larger program. So the simulator is what's going to run everything. Your job is to write one function and one function only, and that's the page of function. You're welcome to write supporting functions and call them in here if you think that'll help you, but this is the entry point for your code, is page it. And you don't really have any control over when page it gets called. But when page it gets called, you have access to the state information, your job is to analyze that state information, decide if any paging operations need to happen. It may not. Uh, it may have gotten called because something exited and you don't actually need to change anything. But if anything needs to happen, you then need to make the appropriate calls to page in and page out before exiting this function and the simulator goes on to continue running the other processes. So because this is our only function and because it's going to get called over and over again, we probably want to maintain some of our own state between those calls to this function. So you're probably going to need to use static variables, where in C, the point of the static variables is it guarantees that the values of these variables get maintained across calls to this function. So this is effectively ways to set up global variables that we can access in our function each time that'll stay the same. So if we're doing predictive work and we have a bunch of state that's in the process of predicting things, we don't want it to be erased every time. I mean, this function's going to get called a ton. And we want to maintain that state across function calls. So anything we want to maintain across function calls, we need to put into static variables. So right now, we're keeping track of just a global tick. This is just increments once every time we get called. It's kind of just a way of keeping track of what's going on in the system. We then maintain a table of timestamps, where it's a two-dimensional array with processes and pages in one direction. We don't actually use this table of timestamps, but if we were going to do an LRU implementation, this table of timestamps would come in handy. It's kind of just in here to show you how to set up this table, even though it's not used in my implementation. But an LRU implementation would use this to effectively, the values <laughs> stored in this array represent the previous tick value that that page was needed. So you search this array for the lowest tick value, that's essentially your oldest page, and that could be the one that you choose to swap out. We have some local variables, where these are just set up for the loops below, we'll get into that. The core body of what we do, like we said, the goal of this strategy is it just picks one process to run at a time. So the start of that is it has a for loop that goes from zero, incrementing by one each time, to at most the maximum of processes, where it's searching for the first active process. So when we hit this for loop, we look at, we, we extract the element in the array that corresponds to the current process number, we see if it's active. Again, this is a zero or one, where if it's completed, this is zero, if it hasn't completed, this is one. So if it's completed, this is going to evaluate to zero. We're going to skip this giant nested if statement and wind up down here uh, and wind up down here at the end and essentially loop to the next one. 
The first active one we land on, we're going to enter that if statement, which ends in a break. So we have a for loop, but the for loop just runs until it finds the first active process and then it breaks out. So we're effectively only dealing with the first active process that we find in this loop. Once we find an active process, then we have to go about figuring out, well, what page we need. And what page we need is always a function of our program counter. So we just pull our program counter out of this global state for the current process. The page, then, you can calculate is the program counter divided by the page size, right? The program counter points to an address in memory. If you divide the address by the page size, you wind up with what page that address corresponds to. So we figure out what page we need. We update this timestamps. Again, we don't actually use this, but we keep track of it just because you could conceivably use it to do it more. This is here just to help you show you guys how to keep track of this. It's not used by this implementation, but it updates the timestamp of the current page for the current process because we're needing it. So that indicates that we should update the timestamp with the current value of 10. Did it okay thus far? So then we have to figure out, well, this is the page we need. Is it already swapped in or is it swapped out? If it's swapped in, we're good. We can kind of not do anything else. We just exit the loop. We exit our page of function. We wait until we get called again. It means that the page that it's currently on is in use uh, and it's already swapped in. So we know that the simulator needs to be running it without any explicit action on our part. So we look at. Uh, so we go ahead and look at whether or not. We look at the current page map, we look at the page we need on that page map, where again, if that's a zero, meaning it's swapped out, this is going to evaluate to true, we'll then run all this code to deal with swap from in. If it's swapped in, this will be a one, not into a zero, meaning this if statement fails, and if it's swapped in, that's when we jump straight down to this bridge. So we find out what page we have. If the page we need is already swapped in, we're done. We just exit the function and we get called again. Now. Um, even if it's swapped in, we're going to get called every time because we're effectively blocking the other 19 processes that all need their first page that we're not giving them access to. So we're going to get called a bunch of times even when we don't have to do anything. So most of the time, the, the common path is this is statement's not even going to run. Um, it's only when we actually move to a new page in the current process that this runs. It's a super conservative solution. Um, if that page isn't available, so if it's swapped out, then we're going to go ahead and try to swap it in where we call the page in function. Again, like we said, if the page in function completes successfully, meaning it started that paging in process, or the process is already in, in progress, then this is going to return a one. We're going to skip all this if statement. The body of this if statement is what to do if this fails, meaning that all of our global pages are in use. Now, given the way we've written this in the current constants, page in is always going to succeed. The only time page in fails is if all 100 of those processes are currently in use or all 100 of those pages are currently in use. We're only running one process at a time. At most, one process can use 20 pages. So the maximum number of pages we're ever going to have, the maximum number of pages ever in use is always never going to be more than 20. So page in is always going to succeed simply because we never even exceed, we never ask more than 20 pages at once. Does that make sense? So I could cut out all this code and it would work just fine. There is some code here mainly just to demonstrate how to use the calls to the other functions. For this given implementation, this code never actually runs. So again, if it, the page in starts successfully, we go through, we just exit out of the function. Now, if the page in fails, which never actually happens in this implementation, it means that we need to swap out a page. So what it does is it finds, I mean, this takes a very easy page to swap out. It finds the first page that the process is using that it doesn't currently need to swap out. So this for loop does that search. Again, it searches across the pages that the process currently has in use. If it finds a page that isn't the page it needs, because it would be counterproductive for us to swap out the page we currently need. So if it finds a page that it doesn't need, and if, um, if page out succeeds, so this is essentially how it tests whether or not it's paged in. If it's not even paged in, page out is just going to return zero. We'll repeat the loop to find the next page that's we don't need. But if page out succeeds, then we break. We would effectively come back. This program we called again. We would now have an available page the second time through this. We would then be able to call page in successfully. We'd skip all this code. People clear on this? So this code never runs. Page in always succeeds. And we actually spend most of our time already paged in um, because we're just doing one page at a time. But up to this point is what actually matters. This is just here for your benefit. 
we look down at the very bottom of the function, we just do a few things. We increment our tick counter again. That's just, we never use the tick counter, nor do we ever use the timestamps. But if you were to use them, this would become important. We then just void out our timestamps because we never actually read it. This is just to avoid the compiler warning. Just along with that. People clear on this? So with the program counter, are we just looking at the uh, number of, an, or sorry, yeah, which instruction, like number, ex sorry, number of instructions? So the program counter stores a memory address, right? Mm -hmm. A memory address of the next instruction to run. Mm -hmm. So is there any way we can look at the machine, like the machine code of the? Well, the machine code is all live, right? It's a simulator. Um, no, okay. you, there's not any way you can look at it. You can't see what the instruction is. Oh, okay. All you can see is what instruction you need. Okay. Now. The history of course, the program. You can store that. Yeah, you can store where the program counter is going. So I mean. You can see where it might be useful to know what's at that instruction, to see if it's a branch or something, because that instruction will generally dictate what the next instruction is. You can't actually see that directly, but you can kind of get at it subtly by looking at where the program counter goes next. And if you notice the program counter jumping around in certain manners, that's, that's how you start to do predictive stuff. Specific, the, the program counter jumping at to specific locations in a specific order is kind of going to be a heuristic signature for different types of programs. So we're not able to reference the program counter to see what instruction There's nothing, I mean, there's not even a real instruction there. Yeah, it's easy, right? Yeah. The, the, the simulator runs a series yeah. of branches, essentially, yeah. that it's all different, and there's no instructions here. Okay. Um, but yeah, you can't dereference. This is not a real address, this right. is all online. Um, and in real life, you wouldn't be able to dereference it anyway, because it's probably swapped out. I mean, you'd have to swap it in. I mean, the pager itself can't access memory because its job yeah. is to, for some reason, malloc can't call malloc, right? So you would, yeah. In order to dereference that program counter, you need another pager running underneath you to deal with all of this issue of mapping. So, in real life, you almost never analyze the instructions because there's that knowledge boundary there. You can't analyze where the program counter is going, but you can't analyze what it's pointing to. So, this is not an unrealistic uh, limitation. Okay, let's run this real quick. So the simulator, when you compile it, generates this program called test. The simulator is actually pretty robust in the sense that the simulator is actually pretty robust in the sense that um, it has a bunch. It can do a bunch of things to kind of help you visualize what's going on. You can turn on various printouts that deal with um, that deal with printing stuff to the screen. You can generate CSV files that allow you kind of visualize there's an R script that goes with this to visualize what was going on. For our purposes, we're just going to run it wide open, which is going to take a second. But you go ahead and start. It generates a random seed. This random seed controls which processes wind up with which copies of the program, essentially, and controls some things within the programs in terms of how far it jumps. Some of the programs are probabilistic, so this seed determines all of that running. Um, you can hand specify a specific seed. So if you're seeing a bug that only occurs on certain seeds, you can force that seed every time. So when we evaluate it, you're not going to be able to control the seed. But for the purpose of your own testing, you can't control the seed. So when this returns, it spits out some information for us. It tells us it completed successfully. And then it tells us it had this many block cycles versus this many compute cycles, the ratio of those that works out. So that's essentially calculating that metric that we had written over there earlier. So 15 is not very good. We'd like to do a whole lot better. Your job is to then go forth and write something that does this more intelligently than my kind of brain that program does it. The one other feature of the simulator that you may find useful, if we let it run for a sec, um, if you send a if you send a die signal to the or a kill signal to the simulator while it's running, so via control C, it actually spits out a current visualization of the current state of the page table. So this is for processes 10 through 19. The first 10 processes are up here. But as you can see, we're only working on one process at a time. The first process has these pages swapped in. The asterisk represents the current page the program counter is pointing to. So I mean, you, you can see our simulator doing exactly what it said it does. It's handling exactly one process at a time. All of the other processes are blocked, essentially, because they need access to their first page with the program counter sitting in them. So control C at any point during your simulation gives you this kind of nice printout of exactly what the state of that simulation is at that time. Um, control C kills it. There's another signal you can send it. I'd have to look it up. But one of the other signals keeps it running and just prints this out at that instant. So you can use kills, and that signal is probably one of the user-defined signals. Um, it'll be documented. 
But this visualization can help you out. Kind of any questions on the overview of this? There'll of course be a write-up that goes along with it, but hopefully this makes it a little bit clearer what your goal is. So you're going to be asked to write two implementations. You'll all be asked to write an LRU implementation because it's just a good place to start and make sure you know what you're doing. It's pretty simple to write an LRU implementation. 90% of the machine is there. Um, then to really get a good score on the assignment, you'll need to write something that's better than LRU, which means getting into some kind of clever predictive strategies, which is where a lot of the magic in modern day processor design goes into designing clever prediction mechanisms and things in the All right. All right, that's all I need for you guys. If you want to pick up your test, go ahead and come up here and I can hand them out. Otherwise, I'll see you next week. Yeah. Yeah.